Yeah, I'll first get the slides up. I'm not used to this, so I'm going to just walk around. I like to walk around. Hopefully, you can all understand me. Can you all understand me, baby? Yes. Yes? yes. No, I don't like it. I'm not a rock, rock star. <laughs> uh, I need some help. I need some help getting the uh, documents up. Sorry, can you come here? That's all this rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> ah, 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 that's all I know. it is to be able to do this in one go. Ten years ago, this would always fail. We'd be there for half an hour trying to get this to work. Okay, so I'm going to give two talks. I know it's getting late in the day, and I hope I, hope I make them entertaining enough for you to listen to what I'm saying. Um, I'm going to give two talks. The first one is stuff I did many, many years ago uh, as my PhD, but there's possibilities to, to extend these ideas if it catches you, your attention. Then we'll have maybe a little breather, just so I can get some air back in my lungs. And then I'll do another talk uh, about what work I've been do doing more recently, which um, you also might be interested in working on. And I'll be here until the weekend, so by all means come to me if you're interested, being supervised, joint supervised on any of these projects, and I can meet up with you the next day or two and we can go over some preliminary ideas. And I'll most probably be back at some point next year to give a course of some kind and obviously supervise more. We can do this by email, by Skype. So, I'm selling myself a bit, but uh, the idea is to get you interested in a few projects. So, it's really high up here. Um, so I'm going to talk about this stuff here. It goes back to work I was doing in the 90s, but uh, in a sense I didn't publish much from it because I was a PhD student on my own. I had a terrible supervisor who was actually useless, and I really struggled. Um, so I, I didn't know how to write it well, I didn't know how to present it well. Put me in a time machine, 20 years later, all of this is kind of crystal clear to me now. So I, I kind of, ah, if only I could go back and, and, and publish all of this stuff again. So this is where, where uh, I, I'd, I'd be very happy just to, to help one of you or more of you to go through this process and to basically take stuff I did and uh, run with it. So the idea of a language designer's workbench grew out of the semantics community in the, in the 1980s. So in the 1970s, people worked out how to formally specify programming languages. Why is that important? Because all of that stuff's been forgotten now. Why is it important? Because you've got two programs, are they the same? Now, in general, this is a very hard problem, but quite often you can actually make comparisons. When do you do that? When do programmers do that? When do you take a program and change it into another one that's the same? Sorry? Yes! So people do it nowadays. They do it badly, they don't know what they're doing. They're doing C sharp or Java, they're in this ID, blah, 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 blah. yeah? And this is what real programmers in real jobs are doing, writing real code that controls aeroplanes that you sit in. Just think about that. Think about it, yeah? So they don't really have, you know, all of this stuff was understood in the 70s and 80s. And the idea of this idea of the workbench in the 80s was that you'd, um, you have, you, you've been an ID for designing languages. Not just for programming, but you've developed languages in a, in a way that you all understood and agreed upon. So refactoring would be automatic because you understand this kind of stuff. Not just faff around inside your C-sharp and not really know what you're doing. But the project failed. 
because partly there was too much focus on compiler generation, which is not hard, what I did as a PhD. Um, and I'll talk about it. But too many people thought that was very, very important. Uh, they weren't uh, focused on other aspects. My arms are not long enough, so I can't point on that. Uh, they weren't focused on other aspects of programming. Because these were mathematicians, they liked semantics, so they didn't think about de debugging, refactoring, and um, what are, error checking. They didn't think of software engineering. That was a real problem. And there was no agreement on the best semantic method. So lots of different formalisms grew. Everybody, because they're academics, they had their own little thing. Oh, like how wonderful publishing unique bits, but they meant there wasn't a cross community effort. And in some ways, the semantic community moved on. So it, I'm quite glad not to be, to be involved in that area anymore because you look at the page post in formal semantics of programming languages and you need at least four or five years of mathematics to be able to get there. There's lots and lots of theory in the, you know, the, the defined quantum computer language. They haven't made a quantum computer, but they already know what the languages are going to look like. Cool, but it's all a bit difficult. Um, <coughs> So the motivation of this work, so our ability to cope with the increasing complexity of software systems is limited by the programming languages we use to build them. If you're a Java or a C Sharp programmer in industry, do you know all of Java, all of C Sharp? No. no. You only ever know a small amount. These languages are too big. The libraries are too big. So what do you do when you get a new job? You arrive and you talk rubbish. You say you can do things because you know you hack them out, and that's what's happening. So you know, people don't really know what they're doing, and they cut and paste in code. Yeah, you all cut and paste code. That thing works. Cut and paste from good on Wikipedia on this design pattern. Oh, I've cut and paste. Really worrying. You know, this is what people are doing. So the idea of domain-specific software languages is really just to build a small language for your particular task. Obviously you don't want to have a particular language for a particular problem. You want to have a language that captures a broad problem area. It's hard, but that's what the idea of a language workbench is meant to help you with. So by providing notation, analysis techniques, verification schemes, optimization rules, there are specialized in application areas. So we want to think of the area that you're programming into, and not the language, a general language that you can use. Because otherwise, you end up always taking a sledgehammer, a big hammer, bang, just to move that. Yes? When you can just use something very small. You don't need to do that. Yeah? Okay? So... The possible project, and I'm going to come back to this after a bit of discussion, is to implement the semantic descriptions in a user-friendly environment. So people did this back in the, in the 80s for the notation I'm going to show, but I don't think they pushed it far enough. Uh, and we can push it a lot further, and that we can push it a lot further with ideas of only having parts of the program, and parts of the input-output, and try to generate the program from that very concerned more with the security, authenticity of code. Because when you're running code nowadays, you don't really know what it's doing. You can be running a piece of code and it can be sending stuff on the internet while you, you have no idea what's going on. Unless you're monitoring the internet connection as well. Explore automatic static checking, debugging and refactoring. So these nobody thought about before. So if you had an environment that automatically when you try to do refactoring, make sure that your refactoring were correct. This is something that you can do. Um, a fun thing that I never got around to doing was a self-applicable compiler generator. So I'll show you briefly the tool, that the idea of the, some aspects of the tool I created. But I never got to the point where I applied it to itself. So have any of you seen the film Ghostbusters? Yes. yes. Yeah? Seen the film Ghostbusters? You remember that scene when they go into the restaurant of the hotel? And the guy at the end goes, wait, I just want to grab this and pull it away. Yeah? That is what the self-applicable compiler generator would be. 
you'd write a tool and you'd write the, the language, the specification of the language in that tool, then you'd apply it to itself and you'd be pulling it away. And no one has done that. And that would be fun. Very fun because the compiler generator I used, I've developed, I proved correct. So the thing you'd do would be completely correct. And so you'd usually have something that was trustworthy. In this day and age, that's worth it. And the thing I didn't do, I left my target notation quite high level, was to look at converting generalized abstract machines, which I'll show that I create, into something a lot lower, C or fourth. Again, when you're coding nowadays, you're using these clunky environments. I said you don't really know what they're doing. It would be really nice if you're using something very lightweight to run something that might be actually quite complicated and that you could trust. And fourth would be a great area to do this. So you'd be able to basically guarantee some your software was robust and it wasn't doing anything dodgy. So I'll briefly elucidate the methodology. So there are three main formal semantic approaches. I don't know if you've covered any of this in your courses, because I have absolutely no idea. Uh, the first is denotational. Meanings are modeled by mathematical objects. So you've got a piece of, piece of your source language, say an assignment statement, and you show that it, this, this is a mathematical object it represents. This technique was developed in the 70s. One of the outstanding questions was, OK, you convert this into that, but does that actually make any sense? And the answer was yes. They have a, a model for the functional notation that you uh, generate. The other one is operational. So there you, give a, you have your programming language, and you explain the operational behavior of each construct. Now, you can do this in a variety of ways. You can do it in quite a high-level way or quite a low-level way. My thesis takes a high-level way down to a low-level way, essentially. And then you have axiomatic um, semantic methods. These are using logical statements about the rules of, a, of a, or the properties of a programming language. So this is, is, is a very useful technique if you're doing code correctness. So C sharp provides code contracts. Some of you might be aware of. I don't know. You could include contracts into your code, and that's essentially axioms, that's essentially going through the axiomatic semantics. It's the idea that uh, came out of Tony Hall's work in the 60s. So I'm going to look at a natural semantics for a while language. There's going to be quite a lot of rules. I'm going to just try and focus on the essential bits of the rules. Hopefully you won't be too scared. But if you are, just slow me down. Just say, Steve, too quick. Don't get it. It's OK. Some of you will get it, some of you won't. There are guys who don't, the girls who don't get it, don't be afraid to put your hand up. It's not a problem. Because um, I've seen this for too many years. I can't remember what it's like to have struggled with it the first time. And I did struggle with it. It's not you. So if we can think of a very simple programming language, we have numerical expressions, we have Boolean expressions, then we have statements. This is about as simple a programming language as we can get. All of the ideas scale up, but I'm just focusing on the simple as well as possible. Okay? So I'll, I'll give an algebraic data definition. Have you seen things like this before? Yes. Have you seen data types written in that kind of notation? Kind of a functional style notation. Yeah? So I'm saying an expression can either be a number, a variable, or addition. It can be subtraction, division, blah, blah, blah. Simple, simple, simple. A Boolean expression can be true, false, and then we can have an and. It can be an or or not, but we'll just focus on and. And then the statements, they can be assignments, sequences, conditionals, or while loops. So that's all we have. And the way I define this, the, uh, well, before I get to the, the rules themselves, I also need to have um, a little environment. Because while I'm interpreting this programming language, I need to remember what the variables map onto. Because you can write in this programming language, let me see, this work. Uh, 
So the point being is when you write a program like this, behind the scenes we're saying initially A. Are you okay? Yeah. Oh, you're very keen. There we go. So we've got an old program behind the scene, we initially have A maps onto three. So what we're going to do is just model that by having a list where we have A, 3, like that, okay? And then as we go down, this, this will be updated. So we need to have a look up and update in order to be able to define our rules. So now we have our rules for numerical expressions, and this is what they look like. So the first rule would be basically saying that if you've got this environment, which initially is going to be an empty list, let's say, and we've got so this means that within the con this context, this piece of language, which is going to be, say, num uh, 3, evaluates to what? It just evaluates to 3. For variables, we're going to look up the value in the environment. And for addition, we first evaluate the left-hand side, we get the result. Then we evaluate the right-hand side, we get the result. And then we do the sum. So the R1 plus R2 is actually doing the piece of mathematics. So if we had an expression here of add 3, 4, we end up, sorry, that's going to be, whoops, I got that bit wrong. We have add, this is num, 3, num, 4, and that splits into two problems, num, 3 goes to 3, oops, num, 4 goes to 4, and that results in 3 plus 4, which you all know is 7. Okay, so that tells you how you break down program into its smaller pieces and evaluate, and you break it down by building these things which are called proof trees. We just fill them all the way up. So what would be quite nice, maybe, is if somebody put seven here, and then I add num three, uh, num question mark, could you then go the, all the way backwards and deduce that this should be a num four? So that's one of the projects. That would be quite fun to do. So you'd have partial programs, partial input-output, and be able to try and work out what program created that truth. So you can then have rules for Boolean expressions. They're very much the same as the previous ones. True results in true, false goes to false. Um, and the add rule you first to the left-hand side and then the right-hand side. <coughs> Moving on to statements, they get slightly more complicated. Why? Uh, because the, yeah, why they get more complicated is now the environment isn't just abstracted on the statement. It is updated by the statement. Boolean expressions and arithmetic expressions, they evaluate and return a value. 
But statements update the state, hence the name. Have you ever thought about that? Statements update the state, yeah. So, if you have an assignment like here, initially you have nothing. After you do this assignment, then you have a map to three. <coughs> You've updated. And the update, when it gets to the empty list, will create that. Create this binary. Then sequences are much the same as before. You first do the left hand side, you get a new environment, row dash. Then you use that new environment, row dash, to create row double dash with the second statement. And then you get your result. Okay, those two are okay. Are you following kind of vaguely? Yeah? Good. Things get a bit more complicated with conditionals and while loops. But let's just take our time. So we've got two, two rules for each. So the first rule says, okay, we've got a conditional, a Boolean statement, S1, S2. If the Boolean statement returns true, then we do S1. That's what the first rule says. So we do the B right at the top. If it evaluates the true, then the result of doing the conditional is a result of doing S1. Conversely, if B evaluates to false, then we're going to do S2. And that's what updates our state. And it's pretty similar for the rules for while except that I do a bit of recursion. So the while loop is defined in terms of, and I'm missing a bracket, I'm sorry. Yeah, I've done it before. Normally, the person who finds a typo is allowed a beer. I found my own typo in the sequence. It should be another bracket. So no beer for anybody tonight. Um, so basically, the rule for a while, if it's true, then it will first do the statement and then do the while loop again. And the rule for the false case is we don't do anything. So that was a kind of input to my compiler generator. So I have a system where you type these kind of rules in, and it would generate a machine. So one thing one can first do is an interpreter generation. So you can directly interpret these kind of rules. The denotational style can be done using functional language. Okay? Because basically it is saying this bit of code returns as functions. So a functional language is fine. For an operational semantics like the one I gave you, um, using these logical rules, you can use prolog. If you know what this prolog is, it's a logic programming language. You can basically type my rules into a prolog system and run your run programs, run little while programs. And if it's in a lower level operational language, then you can implement it in C or fourth, quite elegantly. And axiomatic systems simply don't provide enough information to interpret programs. So there's nothing much you can do. It will tell you some properties of programs, which you might want, whether a value is greater than this or less than that. But it won't tell you exactly how to calculate that value. So there's quite a lot of potential for working on interpreter generation using partial descriptions, especially for the sake of uh, looking at security. From a relational point of view, by converting the natural semantics that I showed into prolog, you can interpret uh, these, 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 these little uh, programs like this very easily. And that was done in the 80s. Um, but we can also use unification. As I mentioned here, one can possibly go backwards with partial programs. So partial bits here, you've got some of the output and you work backwards using unification to derive potential programs. It's not trivial to do in Prolog, I tried doing it. It requires quite a lot of extra machinery. Um, and I kind of ran out of time. But it would be nice if somebody took, took a step back and attempted this um, with a bit more energy. Also, it's a large problem. And so it might, you might not get lucky. You might not be able to derive the, the uh, potential attack program that's attacked your system, depending on the outputs it's generated. But it might be worth doing, especially in this day and age where you where forensics is quite a hot topic. You might want to do more than just look at hard drives and work out where problems were. You might actually need to rework some code. 
Um, going back to the aspect of compiler generation, there are two techniques, both well-known techniques. One is partial evaluation, one is path separation. So whether you're doing uh, compiler generation or not, these are very useful techniques to be aware of. They're good techniques to have um, as programmers. So partial evaluation takes a program and some of its data, which you might have, so it's the idea of maybe doing generic programming, is you write a very general piece of code and you have some of its parameters and you run the program with some of those parameters. And you get a smaller program. That's partial evaluation. The name kind of tells you. You've got all this evaluation, and you can do some of it. And then the second stage is going to be a lot quicker, a lot smaller. But in terms of compiler generation, you get this equation, where if you've got an interpreter with some programs, some data, you can partially evaluate the interpreter with the data, sorry, with the program, as a first step, and then there's a second step with the data. So that, that community did a lot of work in the 80s and early 90s. And they called it population. They even applied partial evaluators to themselves. But essentially, what they, they weren't really compiling. They were compiling into a functional language. They weren't compiling as I thought of it. As compiling would be going down levels of abstraction to machine code, not just staying in a functional language. So I found the path separation equation far more seductive, where you take an interpreter of program and data and you invent these two uh, stages. One is a compiler stage and one is an executor stage. So the compiler is a function that takes the program and, and, and simplifies it into its own new data structure, which I'll show you an example of. And the second one is an executor phase, which then runs it. And that's nice, because then we may be going down levels of abstraction. So in my PhD thesis, I used a double staging transformation to achieve what I wanted. Um, the first stage lifted out the environment, because typically you can look at your code, and you know what your variables are, and you can replace all these variables by memory addresses. Or what you might be doing in a Java c sharp language is these are going to be references into a, into a heap. You kind of know you need that structure in order to run your programs. So it's basically a standard transformation that takes your, your program represented as a tree and changes it where you have A's and B's variables down here. It's going to change it into something that has memory of A and memory of B. It's a, a structure preserving mapping, so it's not too difficult to automate that, especially because you know it's going to terminate because the, pro the input is finite, so it's, it's not a difficult transformation. The second phase would convert terms in the source language into abstract machine instructions, and the third phase is then run them. So, <coughs> the second phase on our little language here, some examples is it takes a number and it returns, it goes through this uh, control stack and basically munges through the tree and flattens it. Essentially what it's doing is flattening. So it's going to create these instructions, num, var, store, loop, in that slide. The, the all capital ones are going to be instructions for the final executor phase. And this is done automatically. So I've, I've, I've jumped a few steps. But the key point here to note is that on the left-hand side, you have expressions in the, in the source language, high level. And on the right-hand side, we've got things in a flattened form. So I've taken that tree and I've converted it into a form that's going to be just a list of instructions with, say, num, tree, num, for, um, and then add, or in this case would be add. So you flatten the tree into a sequence of instructions. And alongside that, I would also actually generate a 
machine that would work through these instructions and update the state. So basically, I just have a runtime. C is just a runtime list of instructions, and to the left, to the right of that, I just have a stack of numbers and the memory. And I'm just updating these things as I go, go along. So this will be generated automatically from the rules I showed you. So you'd end up at this level. <coughs> and that's basically where I stopped my PhD because I kind of run, ran out of time and I was hungry. I needed a place to live, I needed money. So things got, you know, I didn't, I didn't go as far as I wanted. But what I did in my final result chapter is I showed it working for various different models of the lambda calculus. So I don't know if you've covered the lambda calculus. Yeah? So I did the call by value, call by name, call by the. So I thought, yeah, I've proved that it works for everything. I've proved the transformation correct of my use cases. So, so kind of, fair enough, I've done. Uh, didn't get any good publications from this, just in some workshops. Um, and it ended up being a bit ugly, um, a lot of the mathematics. But all of this could be redone in a far more elegant way, and there'd be easy publications from this. So, the generated abstract machines can be further optimized. I didn't do that, I said I ran out of time. Um, one could target custom hardware, like field programming and gate arrays. One could do that. Um, However, I think it would be far more sensible just to target C or fourth. Fourth especially because it's a stack machine language. So the translation would be very nice. So you could then end up with a fourth, fourth interpreter, which could be really, really aggressively optimized as well. Um, so the, the, the hit of using this kind of methodology in terms of runtime execution, I don't think would be too high, but I never got to that stage. Um, but this is one, one area which we really worth exploring. Okay, so the other area is, is to look at static checking. They didn't really work really doing this in the 70s and 80s, but nowadays type systems are very important. So here's just an example of a type system for um, expressions. So here we end up having an environment that maps variables to their types. In this case, it can be num, bool, or whatever. The key point is rule three, where we're saying before we even try and run a program, we can work out like you do when you compile. It will check whether the first expression will return a number, the second expression will return a number, and if that's true, then the addition will also return a number. You can go ahead. If one or the other isn't null, then there's no rule that can apply, so you can't build a proof tree, so that means it's wrong. Okay? So these can be implemented in Prolog or any other language. And they would be nice to, to explore this as, as part of a language designer's workbench, especially with refactoring and all the rest of it. So these are some expand the, the list of potential projects a bit more. So uh, what do we have? One, implement the semantics descriptions in a user-friendly environment, enable both forwards and backwards execution. Enable refactoring strategies to be proven correct and applied within the environment. So if you did a refactoring on your language that you developed, the system would actually turn on a theorem prover and try and make sure that what you're doing was correct and you're not creating, well, introducing a bug. Automatically generate and animate static checkers. Dynamically verify refactoring. Um, Self-applicable compiler generator. So by, by what I'd do there would be to redo my compiler generator and apply it to itself, pulling the sheet underneath. Um, so then you wouldn't have any unreliable language. You'd say, this is my language. My compiler generator is based on that. And it runs on this lower level technique. So that would be 0.5. We'd want to run these abstract machines on C or 4. And this would allow for experiments on what lightweight runtime um, generalization or implementation of DSLs. So that would be the first, um, that's the end of my first talk. 
uh, these are kind of areas of interest in, in the house. Are there any questions from you guys? Yeah. No. Two remarks. Uh, no offense, but uh, your no, examples look like exercises from Square Foundation's book. Yeah. Very much. What's the difference? What do you mean, the, the programming language? Yes. Yeah, yeah. It looks just like an, like an exercise from Square Foundation. Because I'm not going to have 30 rules on 20 slides in a talk. That, that wasn't the point. Mm. My question is, what, what did you do in your PhD? So what's different from Software Foundations? All these conversions from tree-like language to least-like language. They're all automated. In Software Foundations, they are made in code. Somewhat automated. That was that was done after when I did my work. Mm. Well, okay. Yeah. Then I send this one with questions and partial, partial things. You yeah. can actually do that if you uh, encode that language in Agda uh, with um, in Agda type families. Then you could insert this. Question marks, uh, yeah. ask to type check and it will derive all the stuff you want. So it's already done, basically. Some of it's, it's been done, but not within a workbench. What's the difference between uh, formalizing the language as an inductive type family and then special workbench for formalizing the languages as inductive type families? It's, it's, it's the user interface, it's making it easy and the one. Sorry? Only syntax changes. Um, well, and linking it with the other, other features. But yes, you're right. If I haven't seen what Agda can do. So I'll, I'll reserve my... I, I'm not sure of how far I can push that. Because I tried doing this and I found it... You can just encode your proof tree uh, syntax in Agda and it will do if it. If it does all of those yeah. things... With question marks for yes, arbitrary question, question marks. marks. Actually, I did this thing in Agda. It's much easier all the Fair Foundation in Agda. All this compiled uh, transformation of stuff. And it's more than able to, to generate the progress. Yes. Fair enough, then, knock that one off the list. I, I didn't realize it could do that. Okay. Okay, well, 